The hyperregulation prevents elementary improvements that can be done with existing plants, prevents progress to going to more advanced type of reactors. If the FAA was run by the NRC, we would have no airlines. Hi, I'm Ed D'Agostino, partner at Malden Economics. And this week, I have a fascinating conversation for you. Dr. Robert Zubrin, nuclear and aerospace engineer and author of The Case for Nukes, joins us today. Before we start, be sure to subscribe to the channel and leave us a comment. Thank you for joining us this week at Global Macro Update. Dr. Zubrin, thanks so much for taking some time. It's not every day I get to speak with a, a nuclear scientist, so I'm excited to have this conversation. And before we get into nuclear, I was hoping we could maybe just talk a little bit about the sort of the, the baseline situation with energy in the world right now. Is my my belief and everything that I've been doing research-wise tells me that the need for energy globally and in the U.S. is only going up. Is that consistent with what you believe? Well, sure. Uh, that's absolutely consistent. In the past 30 years, uh, since uh, people started, you know, trying to do things about global warming and so forth, and they said they were going to reduce carbon consumption, uh, the amount of energy in used worldwide has doubled, and almost all of that has been carbon fuels. Uh, and by the way, uh, just as it doubled between 1960 and 1990, and between 1930 and 1960, and between 1900 and 1930. Um, and uh, the effort to uh, prevent global warming by making energy unaffordable uh, first of all, is unethical, and second of all, hasn't worked um, because people don't want to be poor, and energy is necessary to make all the things that people need, and uh, so you're not going to constrict energy consumption as uh, world standard of livings rise, as they should, um, because you know the average standard of living in the world is uh, $12,000 per year, which is well below the U.S. poverty line. And half of the world is below average. Uh, and so we've got a, a long way to go to, to raise the world to an average standard of living equal to the current United States. We'd have to increase world energy consumption five times. And, um, and, and in fact, and that should be the project for the 21st century. Energy demand is going to go up exponentially, essentially, is what you're saying. If we, be, if we are fair and give the rest of the world the same opportunities that the West has had. Yes. Um, so energy cost needs to remain low or even get lower. And I, I also yeah. think everyone can agree, all things being equal, clean, a cleaner source of power is better. Right? Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't seem controversial. Look, you do this through technological progress. We didn't get uh, horse manure out of the cities by making horses unaffordable. We did it by introducing a cleaner technology, namely automobiles. Okay, and the automobiles themselves have gotten cleaner over time. Uh, and the, the way we're going to um, get past fossil fuel pollution is by introducing a cleaner technology and incidentally a cheaper and more plentiful source of energy because that's also what the world needs. The world doesn't just need clean energy, it needs plentiful energy, it needs cheap energy. So when I was reading your book, one of the things that surprised me that you were talking about as a benefit of nuclear energy, and that, that's where all, all these roads that we've discussed, they all sort of point to nuclear, right? So right. If, yes. if nuclear is the answer, um, there's obvious solutions that it solves, but then there's some other things that weren't so obvious to me. Like you, one thing you mentioned that really kind of blew my mind was how you could take waste heat from nuclear energy and you could use that to desalinate salt water. So any plants near an ocean, you could actually expand agricultural land by a lot just through irrigation water. How, how, how does that even work? Well, uh, to desalinate seawater, you evaporate it. The salt is left behind. The vapor is fresh water. Uh, that's well known. But you need heat to do that. With nuclear power, you have plenty of waste heat, um, which you get for free. Um, also, nuclear power, if you're in places like uh, Scandinavia and so forth, you can use the waste heat to uh, heat water that you run under the sidewalks and warm the city uh, that way as well. Um, 
but uh, you can do other things with uh, nuclear power. Um, I mean, obviously, you can do all the things you can do with any power with it. You can light up cities. You can run industrial processes. Uh, you could put nuclear power plants on floating platforms in the middle of the ocean and pump water up from the deep and release it at the surface. And the deep water is nutrient rich. Uh, the, all the life in the ocean, 90% of it comes from 10% of the ocean, the continental shelves and the upwelling areas like the Grand Banks. 90% of the ocean is essentially a desert. It's bereft of nutrients. and But the deep water has the nutrients because it hasn't been stripped by photosynthetic organisms. If you create artificial upwelling, you could create the Grand Banks everywhere. We could multiply the world's fisheries uh, enormously. Um and uh, and in the process, by the way, that is also a carbon negative way to increase food because the phytoplankton are fi fixing CO2 out of the atmosphere at the same time. So it's a double whammy. And these are the sorts of things we could do with nuclear power. Yeah, I was hoping I would get you to talk about just a few of the things that I found so inspiring in, in your book. And yet you then get into how, at least in the United States, we sort of can't get out of our own way with regard to nuclear. It's it, it, it seems like now is the time in many ways. There's never been more interest in nuclear energy in this country from, from all ends of the spectrum, it seems like. A small modular reactor project was just canceled. We just can't seem to get these things going. Why is that? What what do we do wrong here, regulatory wise, that the rest of the world doesn't? First of all, you know the United States invented nuclear power. We did the Manhattan Project, and then we did the Nautilus, and then we did Atoms for Peace. And by the early 1970s, uh, we were getting orders for two new nuclear power plants in the United States every month, uh, and we're going like gangbusters. Uh, but then what happened was, uh, well, it, it's a complex story, and it's discussed in my book, uh, The Case for Nukes. But uh, the oil uh, cartel actually was afraid of nuclear power, and they funded the Sierra Club and several other organizations to go after it. And in the Carter administration, um, they uh, installed um, – the, the Carter administration installed, not the oil companies, but uh, – a, a regulatory structure that was extremely hostile to nuclear energy, uh, 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 almost unbelievably hostile, uh, one which is amenable to intervention at every point along the project by hostile uh, competitors. Uh, you know, imagine you were trying to build a house and the regulatory structure was that not only did you need to get an approval, uh, but at every step of the construction, people were allowed to file lawsuits to stop you from uh, uh, building the house. And not only that, a criteria they could use is uh, for denying continued construction is proof to us why this house is necessary. Proof to us why this should be a Cape Cod house and not a chalet. Uh, proof to us why we shouldn't have a candy store at this location instead. Uh, and and then if the judge even rules in your favor, it can be appealed. It, it, it's a nightmare. And as a result, Okay, the first nuclear power plant, okay, well, in the Nautilus, three years from program start to going to sea. The Nautilus being the, uh, the, the first nuclear submarine, correct? Correct. Okay. And then the one first one on land, shipping port, three years. Okay, now those were relatively small plants, but by the late 60s or so, we were building full-size nuclear power plants in four years. The time to build them should have gone down since then. Instead, because of the hyper-regulation, it's gone up. It's gone to 16 years. And as I show in the book, you can actually track this. As the time to increase a nuclear power plant is increased, the cost of the plant has gone up as the time squared. Okay, now that's an amazing figure. And and the the the, the it's gone up as the time squared because, first of all, cost is people times time. But in addition, the longer these things get strung out, you're not just paying plumbers, you're paying lawyers, and they cost a lot more. And um, and it's just gotten out of control. And so as a result, America, the country that invented nuclear power, has completely stagnated, whereas you take France, for example, which went forward on this, 
And by the 1990s, they decarbonized their power grid. They've got 75% of their power is nuclear. Another 15% is hydroelectric. They only have 10% fossil fuels. Uh, Whereas uh, Germany, which is dominated by so-called green parties, produces six times as much carbon emissions for every uh, kilowatt of electricity as France. And they shut down most of their, or or maybe all of their nuclear. I don't know. Yes, they did. And there were (laughs) geopolitical aspects of that as well, because you have uh, large elements of the German political elite is actually uh, aligned with Russia. And they wanted to shut down the nuclear power plants in order to fund Russia through natural gas purchases. The Russian invasion of Ukraine was literally funded by German natural gas purchases. And um, thank God someone blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. But that's that's another story altogether. But but basically, the German Greens opposed nuclear power uh, because it solved a problem they needed to have. And that, in fact, is is why most of the uh, environmentalist movement uh, opposes nuclear power. It solves a problem they need to have. Well, you bring up one of my favorite topics, which is geopolitics. Yes. We're not immune to that either, right? In this country, we we let our uranium mining go. There's no uranium yes. mining left. Um, there are some mines that are sort of, they've been sort of put on the, kept semi-active, I guess you would say is the right way to describe it. But we're not really mining any uranium substance. We rely on primarily Russia for both mining and refining which is mind blowing to me. It's insane. Uh, And because of obviously nuclear power is not only something that is useful civilian applications, it's what powers our submarines, uh, which is the most important part of our nuclear triad because it's the one that is immuno to uh, counter advanced strike. So we've got regulatory issues. We've got issues with sourcing the fuel. Um, what other issues do we have in this country that are obstacles to, to nuclear waste disposal? Can, can, do we have a place to store the waste safely? Uh, sure, actually. The Navy stores its waste in the Waste Isolation Protection Facility in New Mexico. There's no technical problem to storing nuclear waste. But the environmentalists, uh, it, well, look, here's a very interesting thing. In the 60s, the environmental movement was pro-nuclear because they saw it rightly as a cleaner alternative to coal and oil. Okay, but then what happened was uh, they got paid to become anti-nuclear, and so they did. And But what they said, the Sierra Club, in its statement where it reversed its position on nuclear power in 1974, they said the following things. They said, number one, the reason why we're opposed to nuclear power is because it could lead to unnecessary economic growth. Okay. <laughs> Two, the way we're going to stop nuclear power is by stopping the establishment of a civilian waste disposal facility and thereby create uh, a major problem, possibly an insolvable problem for the commercial nuclear industry. So you have these people who will shout all day long about how dangerous nuclear power is. And they are the ones forcing the nuclear industry to store their waste near nuclear power plants, which are located reasonably close to major metropolitan areas, as opposed to putting it in an underground facility under a mountain in the desert in Nevada. Now, which is safer? They'll, they'll come up with all sorts of scenarios of how the Nevada facility is unsafe because, you know, uh, after our civilization collapses, there'll be an ice age and the savages that roam the post ice age uh, landscape won't be able to read the warning signs of the nuclear waste dump and some might get hurt. OK, instead, they want to store the nuclear waste within 50 miles of Chicago. You know, the, 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 this is just crazy. Um, and um, so but once again. Nuclear waste is is solving a problem they need to have, and they're trying to create problems for nuclear energy that it doesn't need to have. Do you feel like that's changing? Because I I have a lot of friends who are environmentalists, and I and I know unequivocally their heart is in the right place. And um, uh, three years ago, if you'd asked me about nuclear, my in, my reaction, initial reaction, would have been probably pretty negative. But I've really not just through your book, but several other books. Uh, tried to educate myself on on the the real issues around it. And your book in particular was very helpful in helping understand what's the risk 
and and what really is um, how those risks can be solved with good engineering. Well, you see, what happened was this. I, I agree with you. Um, the 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 professional environmentalists, that is the ones who make their living by promoting environmental alarm, as opposed to the public, which is concerned, you know, uh, uh, concerned about various environmental concerns. Uh, they were using global warming as an agitational issue uh, to create great alarm and um, in support various deindustrialization initiatives. But what happened was they managed to alarm people outside of their own mailing list. That is to say, the public at large, okay, the people outside of the uh, congregation. And so then you get common sense people saying, oh, my God, global warming is an existential threat. We have to do something about this. Well, nuclear power uh, doesn't have any carbon emissions. Why don't we do that? And of course, what the Greens answer was, well, no, 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 we hate that. No, no, no. You're going out the wrong door here. Yes, you do have now an emergence of what you might call um, a center left uh, faction, uh, you know, the kind of people that, say, read the New York Times, uh, who are been now there could have been made concerned about global warming and they're looking at various solutions. And if they're being told global warming is an existential threat to civilization, that is existential threat is the word that's used, which means it's a threat to the existence of civilization. OK. And somebody says, well, yes, this could solve that. But, you know, what are you going to do with the waste? I mean, that doesn't add up. So th there's a group, it's called the Third Way, which, for instance, includes people like uh, Cory Booker, who's a senator from uh, New Jersey, and even uh, um, uh, Elizabeth Warren, who's a pretty liberal uh, senator. I think uh, that's fair. Is in it, and they are uh, have become favorable towards nuclear power to various degrees. Um, now, unfortunately, um, the Democratic Party is uh, split. It still retains a hardcore of environmentalists who are doing a rearguard action against nuclear power and um, still preventing the establishment of a waste facility for the commercial industry in Nevada and also resisting what is truly necessary here, which is an overhaul of the regulatory structure. Uh, in my book, I have uh, a flowchart of the regulatory structure of the 32 approvals you need to get to get approval of a nuclear power plant, and that's just to get started. And each of those boxes within that flowchart has an entire flowchart inside of it, and um, it's totally out of control, and uh, and it's unnecessary. And and by the way, it does not contribute to safety. This is a thing that that people need to understand. Um, Early in my career, I, I was actually uh, uh, involved um, in, uh, well, the Washington State Office of Radiation Protection, which was a nuclear safety regulatory organization, but reasonably um, pro-nuclear in the sense that the FAA is pro-aviation. That is, the FAA does not exist in order to make airlines impossible. It makes it exists in order to make sure that airlines are run safely so that we can have airlines. OK. Um, and but anyway, there was this nuclear power plant just across the border in Oregon called the Trojan plant. And we had some authority over it because it was actually uh, closest to um, uh, population centers in Washington state. Anyway, the Trojan plant was an excellent plant. It had been built in the early 70s. It had been built quickly. It was producing electricity at two cents a kilowatt hour, which was not only competitive with fossil fuels, competitive with cheap hydroelectric power available in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but they had a problem, which was in the secondary loop uh, 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 of their steam generators, they were getting corrosion. And, and, and so they had to shut down every six months to replace the pipes. And the utility identified what the problem was. They had gone cheap during construction and used carbon steel for those pipes instead of stainless. So the utility wanted to replace those pipes with stainless. The NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, would not let them do it. It wouldn't let them do it. It said, your license specifies carbon steel pipes for those pipes. And if you want to replace it with stainless, you need to get a new license. And now we're in the late 1980s, and by then getting a new license was... a no one was going to try that, okay? And they'd be shut down for years. And 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 so they just 
kept using the carbon steel pipes rather than make a change. And if you talk about uh, improving nuclear power, okay, you know, we're still using basically the same pressurized water reactor that was demonstrated by Rick over at Shipping Port. Um, and uh, I do not agree with people who say, oh, the problem with the nuclear industry is they're still using the Rick over 1950s design. It's a great design, but sure, it could be improved on. There's all sorts of things one could do that are more advanced than um, a pressurized water reactor, but no one would dare try to introduce them because it's hard enough to get a completely established design licensed without trying to do something new. Um, and so nothing new. We will go with what we have and what the regulators understand and which, you know, the 450 of them have been built around the world since 1957. And, um, and another 500 in submarines. And, you know, so we're not going to try building breeder reactors. No way. Try to get that past the NRC. Forget it. Um, even though it can get almost 100 times as much energy out of a given amount of uranium as a pressurized water reactor can. And it has one one hundredth the waste, um, the same amount of power. Uh, no, we're not going to do that. So the hyperregulation prevents elementary improvements that can be done with existing plants, like replacing corroded carbon steel pipes with stainless. And it, pre it prevents, prevents progress to going to more advanced type of reactors. So this is not a useful structure. It needs to be replaced. If, if the FAA was run like by the NRC, we would have no airlines. And yet around the world, nuclear not only is it is it popular it's it's growing especially in the emerging markets i mean i think yeah. i think you said uh in your book india had seven plants under construction right now with more planned china has significantly more than that if you had to guess how many plants around the world nuclear plants are are operating right now well there's been about 450 uh commercial reactors built uh Probably about 400 of them are still operating because the Germans shut down 20 and a few others, Indian Point was shut down and so forth. But something like 400. And then there's another 400 or so at sea in uh, or no, have been built for submarines. Probably about 200 of them exist in, in current uh, submarines. Uh, but the China between now and 2050 is going to build another 450 nuclear power plants. And that's just inside China. And furthermore, China has now uh, copied a Russian design, um, the VVER, and uh, they are going to eat Russia's lunch in, in um, exporting it to the commercial market, uh, to, to the developing sector. Because the thing that's happening in Africa, for instance, uh, Africa, the need there isn't for village power. The need there is for urban power because the cities are growing. The same thing that happened in all the advanced countries, people move from the country to the city. And now you get need for power at scale. And, you know, in Nigeria, they're always having blackouts um, from inadequate power to meet the growing need of Lagos and so forth. And, and we're going to see a lot of this. And China is going after this market big time. And so it's incredible that, OK, the United States, which invented nuclear power, has basically knocked itself out of this market. Uh, the French offer some competition. The South Koreans offer some competition. But basically, uh, this has been uh, export market has been stolen by Russia and China. And it's and the China is going to steal the Russian part, too. Yet another example of us seeding technology and advances to China. Right. So we become the R&D department of China, Inc. Uh, one thing that you said that concerned me a little bit, you said that, that China was copying a Russian design. If yes. I recall correctly, you, you pointed out how there's sort of three major nuclear uh, events that happen that stick in everyone's mind, or Three Mile Island, Fukushima, and Chernobyl. And you, you you sort of give relevance to each. And the one that that's, I think was clearly the most serious was Chernobyl, and that it was most serious because of the way that plant was designed, or maybe lack of design would be a better way to describe it. Um, it is this system that China is copying similar to the to the Chernobyl design? No, no, the VVR is a conventional pressurized water reactor. 
their Chernobyl reactor was a graphite moderated reactor. Uh, let me explain this a little bit. Okay. Uh, in an atom bomb, you used very highly enriched uranium, at least 60%, and frankly, in a modern American uh, atom bomb, 93% enriched. That is, the percent of fissile U-238 has been enriched from 0.7%, which is what it is in natural uranium, all the way up to 90%. And as a result, you can have a, a, a chain reaction where you don't need to slow down the neutrons. They can just go and... Okay, but in a uh, nuclear reactor, uh, the, typically the fuel is enriched three, four, five percent. Uh, and as a result, in order to sustain a chain reaction, you have to slow the neutrons down. That is, a slow neutron has got more potential of causing a fission than a fast one. See, the, 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 the mental picture that chain reactions are caused by neutrons being like cannonballs bashing other nuclei apart is not correct. It, it's more like they're drifting past nuclei, and there are nuclear forces that if it can reach out and draw the neutro neutron into the nuclei and, and then make it go unstable and it breaks apart. And that's why the slower neutrons, or thermal neutrons as they're called, are more effective. So you need to slow the neutron down. Now, the way you slow the neutron down is by having it do collisions with other light nuclei. For instance, hydrogen, very nice nuclei, one proton. Okay, so water is a very good moderator, as it's called. A moderator is something that slows the neutrons down. And the brilliance of the Rickover pressurized water reactor was the following. Water was the moderator, and it was also the coolant. And if the reactor gets too hot, the water boils too furiously, and now there's big holes in the water, steam bubbles. And when the steam bubbles become too dominant, the water becomes ineffective as a moderator. And so the new this chain reaction shut down. Now, as soon as the chain reaction is shut down, uh, the steam bubbles collapse, and then the chain reaction starts up again. And what actually happens, therefore, is this all happens on a microsecond time scale, and you just see the power level out at exactly the level where you just have a little bit of boiling in the water, okay? And and then if you want to um, increase the power, just pump the water faster so you have more coolant going in, and the power to create that level of boiling in the water goes up. So, and since you can com control the pumps, just by controlling the pumps, you control the power level in the reactor, okay? And this, by the way, is why you can never get a runaway chain reaction in a pressurized water reactor. Because if it tries to increase its power too much, the water boils too much and it automatically stops the chain reaction. So it is physically impossible. You could pull all the control rods out of the, uh, the reactor and you would not get a runaway chain reaction. It can't do it. Okay. The, 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 it just can't do it. And um, whereas the Chernobyl reactor was moderated by graphite, which doesn't boil. And, what they did this goofy experiment where they pulled the control rods out and the uh, reaction started to exponentiate in, in chain, in exponentially increasing chain reaction faster than they could put the thing back in. So it, 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 it did have a runaway chain reaction, not fast enough to be a bomb. For a bomb, you got to have it run away so fast that most of the fissile material releases its energy before the thing could disassemble. Chernobyl disassembled before that, but it disassembled. But then, furthermore, the Chernobyl reactor didn't even have a containment building around it. Okay, That's the key difference, right? That is the second key difference. First, it was graphite moderator, so it could disassemble. And secondly, there was no containment building around it to uh, contain the debris and block air from reaching debris. So now you have a graphite moderated reactor blows itself apart and you have red hot graphite filled with radioactive waste exposed to air, which sets the graphite on fire. And so the reactor was not only unstable, it was flammable. Okay. And and then it just went up and you had total release of all the materials. Um, if it hadn't been composed of flammable materials, uh, the amount that would have been released would have been 
you know, about two orders of magnitude less. Instead, everything got released. Uh, so it was the worst possible reactor design, and it was handled in the worst possible way. And then even the uh, post-accident procedures that the Soviets did were crazy. Um, because the Soviet Union, you know, uh, actually was prepared for nuclear war. So they had uh, uh, arsenals of iodine tablets distributed all around the country to give to people because one of the first, uh, in the immediate aftermath of a radioactive release, the most dangerous thing is radioiodine, because it has um, a short half-life, like 11 days or something. And uh, and short half-life means it doesn't last a long time, but while it's around, it's a real problem because it's doing its thing fast. And so the idea is you eat iodine tablets and it prevents your thyroid from taking in the radioiodine. Well, guess what? the Soviets did not distribute the radioiodine that they had. They had everywhere because they didn't want to admit that there was a problem. So Chernobyl was not um, a nuclear disaster. It was a Soviet disaster, equivalent to any number of other Soviet disasters like dam breaks and housing collapses during earthquakes. And, and it, it, you know, it was... Uh, now, in contrast, Three Mile Island. Okay which was in Pennsylvania in 1979. Okay. The, the reactor was mishandled and coolant was cut off to it. And um, so it overheated. The, uh, the control rods were dropped in, shut down the fission reactor reaction, but a nuclear reactor that's been operating for any length of time, as the Three Mile Island was, has accumulated an inventory of radioactive waste in it, which releases what's called decay heat. Okay, and this it continues to happen even after the chain reaction is shut down. What happens is as soon as those rods go in there, within milliseconds, the power level drops from 100% to 7%. Okay, but 7% is still a lot, and if there isn't coolant there there's enough heat there for the reactor to melt itself. Now, this problem had been known forever, okay? And the environmentalists claimed that what would therefore happen was the fuel would melt itself, and then it would melt itself through the steel pressure vessel surrounding the reactor, which is made of eight-inch thick steel. So it would melt through that, and then it would hit the bottom of the containment building and melt through the eight feet of concrete, and then it would melt through the earth and go down to the center of the earth, and then for some reason come up the other side of the earth and emerge in China. And so this was known as the China syndrome. Now, what actually happened was, yes, the fuel did melt itself, and it hit the bottom of the pressure vessel, and it melted itself about two inches into the eight inches of steel, and there it stopped. And that's what happened at Three Mile Island. It did not even breach the pressure vessel, let alone the containment building, let alone the earth. But wasn't there a release of, of radiation from that, from that accident? There was a small release of, of, um, uh, of, of, of some radioactive gases, but the amount released was so small that the radiation exposure of the local population was less than if they had gone and spent the weekend in Colorado. Uh, the, that is in Colorado, here where I live, uh, because we're at higher altitude, you have a higher level of cosmic rays. Wow. If they had spent the weekend skiing, they would have gotten a bigger radiation dose than living in Harrisburg during Three Mile Island. So it was just nonsense. It's, Three Mile Island was a commercial disaster. A reactor was destroyed, but uh, it's the only mega disaster in human history and not a, in which not a single person was hurt. Right. Okay, and Fukushima, okay, there you had an earthquake and a tidal wave that destroyed an entire city and killed 28,000 people due to drowning and collapsing buildings and all that kind of stuff. Not a single person outside the plant gate got a significant radiological dose. Three plants were destroyed by all that havoc. Not, they were not caused, destroyed by anything nuclear. They were destroyed by a tidal wave. Uh, and so they're destroyed, and yet, because they were pressurized water reactors, there was no significant radiological release. And in fact, Fukushima, if anything, could be an advertisement for the safety of nuclear power plants. It's Fukushima. It means if you got all city destroyed by an earthquake and tidal wave, that nothing happens from the nuke. Um, so, yeah. 
But Chernobyl, that was a nuclear accident, and it was caused by um, engineering that would never be allowed in any civilized country. So there's a lot of talk about small modular rea- reactors, SMRs, sort of the next generation of nuclear, smaller, easier to site. You could potentially build them in a factory uh, and, and then move them to where they need to be. Um, w- but we haven't built one in this country. Is it regulatory issues that are holding them back? Or what, what do you think is the obstacle to uh, this new generation that has had so much money poured into it from people like Jeff Bezos and, and Bill Gates and other billionaires? OK, well, so much money, uh, not quite that much money. It's had some money um, poured into it. But look, the thing, first of all, the thing that's holding back the really big money is the fear that these things will not be allowed to be used because of the regulatory structure. Okay. Now, but it's a good idea. Okay. If you can, any major engineering operation, fabrication operation that you can do in a factory instead of at a construction site, it's much better to do in the factory. A, a typical, like if you want to do a weld, uh, at a construction site, it, on average, it takes eight times as long to do it as at, in, inside of the factory where everything is set up. It's all neat. The equipment's right there. There isn't weather. There isn't, right. Um, the, so the idea is to get as much of the work possible done in the factory and just put a few things together uh, at the construction site. And so it's really not a construction project at all. It's an assembly project. And the so this is a good idea. Now, also, uh, they're building... In order to facilitate that, these are smaller reactors. Instead of a thousand megawatt reactors, these things typically use maybe 75 megawatt modules, which maybe you could assemble four of and you got a 300 megawatt reactor. And the notion here is that, okay, the big reactor has an advantage of economy of scale, but you've got flexibility. You can meet the market of a small town that only needs 75 megawatts or a small city that needs 300 megawatts. You, you're not just building for Chicago and Houston and equivalent kind of places. You can build for uh, uh, more modest kinds of cities, especially those that emerge in, in the third world. And also you can build them in modular fashion. So the thing has engineering merit. Um, but... Uh, the fear is, is that nevertheless, it'll be stopped by the regulators and uh, that's impaired uh, funding and it could impair deployment, frankly, because here's the thing. If the regulators want to stop you, they can stop you. Uh, and also, if you have a regulation structure, which is amenable to intervention at every point by people who are ideologically hostile to the project. Uh it's just impossible to do, to do a business that way. And uh, so that needs to be reformed. And so if the Biden administration is serious, uh, or frankly, Trump, for all his talk, did nothing to fix this problem. Um, uh, if any one of these uh, uh, people are serious about saying we want nuclear power for the sake of the economy, for the sake of fighting global warming, they have to address this issue. So it takes a, a reform process of the yes. of the regulatory agency. Okay, correct. Well, I've added it up, and at least a billion dollars of primarily venture capital money has been poured into, which is kind of the, the holy grail of nuclear fusion. We've been talking so far about fission, the the breaking apart of an atom, and fusion is the combining. Uh, at speaking in layman's terms. How close are we to fusion? Have we gotten to the point where where we even have break even, which you you describe in your book? Well, actually, there was uh, we've achieved break even in, in two different places. The National Ignition Facility, which uses lasers to compress pellets and make them blow up, and then uh, at the Joint European Taurus in um, uh, Britain. Uh, a large experimental tokamak magnetic confinement experiment. They also achieved a break even. So, what what is break even? Just to just to, before we go too far. Break even is when the fusion reaction releases uh, as much or more energy than was used to uh, pr- drive it to light it. Okay, uh, but we need to go beyond break even to what's called ignition, where you get a self sustaining uh, reaction, uh, where. It, it, 
it, it, once you have ignition, um, it, then the energy return uh, becomes not one to one or two to one. It becomes infinite because you basically set the fuel on fire, and from there on, it can burn itself. Um, now, and that's the real holy grail here. Um, now, the thing is this: is okay, I was involved in fusion in the eighties. And uh, we had experienced some pretty fast progress in fusion from the 60s through the 80s based on international competition between national programs. The United States, the Soviets, the Europeans, and Japanese in particular were constantly trying to upstage each other with the, a next milestone accomplishment. And it was pretty uh, exciting. Um, but then, unfortunately, what happened was the bureaucrats heading each of these programs got together one fine day and said, isn't this stressful, all this competition? Why don't we all work together on a single program? And thus, they started this program called ITER, where they decided instead of each one trying to build the next big machine to upstage the other, we would all work together on a single big machine. And this took all this stress out, all the competitive drive, and it took them the next 20 years to decide where to put it okay, <laughs> without even building it. And meantime, the money that would have gone to the next big machines after uh, the, the the jet, the, the joint European Taurus that just did break even um, is a relic from the early 90s uh, in which they've been making minor tweaks to try to get a little better results of it. But what they really needed was the next generation. And similarly with the American program with the TFTR, we should have superseded it and never did. So if you look at our progress in fusion, uh, it goes up until the early 90s on momentum, and then it just nothing happens. Uh, however, and so JET, they only started building it around 2012. They're not going to complete building it until 2030-something, uh, oh, and wow. uh, it's ridiculous. However, the good news is that uh, really as a result of the success of SpaceX, where Elon Musk proved that it was possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things that previously thought that only the governments of superpowers could do, and not only that, do it in one-third the time at one-tenth the cost, and even do things that they had just said, oh, you, no one can do that, uh, like reusable launch vehicles that come back. Uh, investors have taken a look at Fusion and say, well, maybe the problem here is the same as the problem with reusable launch vehicles. Maybe it's not really fundamentally a technical problem. Maybe it's an institutional problem that the wrong kind of organizations are doing it. And as a result, there's a raft of uh, Fusion startups that have gotten some pretty serious money invested in them. Uh, Helion in uh, Washington State, $800 million. Uh, Tri-Alpha Energy in California, $500 million. And uh, quite a number of others that have gotten uh, money over $200 million. And so these are, are and these pro companies are not working on 50-year timelines. They're working on five-year timelines. And so I believe that um, we're going to see ignition, and it's going to come from one of these startups long before IDER is even turned on. Wow. Um, and uh, and that's how this is going to go forward. I, I think we're going to see fusion ignition this decade. That's exciting. That's really exciting. And in terms of like, once it gets going, it's self -per perpetuating. Is that correct? Yes. Well, that's true with magnetic confinement, where you put the fusion ga gas or plasma, as it technically is called, inside of a vessel that contains the plasma magnetic fields. And if you can get that lit, then all you need to do is feed in more fuel. Okay, the the uh, the laser program, there are some people that are fans of it. Um, I am actually not, um, because you have to repeatedly fire these lasers. Each pellet can ignite itself, and you might get a three to one or four to one power return. But you can never get an infinite return because each pellet, you throw it in, zap it, then you got to throw in the next one, zap it. You have to keep zapping. Um, and also, the, for instance, the National Ignition Facility at Livermore that did achieve the ignition in a laser facility. It's a gigantic facility. Really, what that facility was created was to simulate um, thermonuclear explosions for the purpose of understanding uh, weapons. Um, 
the it wasn't really created as um and it does a good job at that um and that's important but uh as an approach to commercial power i believe the magnetic uh confinement and related approaches are um the way to go is there any waste from it there's very little um from the fusion reaction itself, there's essentially no radioactive waste. Uh, now, the fusion reactor can produce a certain amount of neutrons, which can bombard the structure. And for instance, if the structure is made, for instance, of ordinary steel, it can activate it and create medium activation materials. But there are alternative materials that are zero activation. Uh, for instance, if you made it at the, the, the reactor out of graphite, for example, it wouldn't activate at all. Um, so the fusion has vastly less radioactive waste than uh, fission. And in principle, it could be made to have no radioactive waste. Dr. Zuberman, I really appreciate the time. I just want to hold up your book because uh, for, for any viewers, uh, anyone who's nuclear curious, I have to say this is a really eye-opening book, The Case for Nukes from Dr. Robert Zuberman. Doctor, thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you.